Hello and welcome to the much promised, rather late video to do with um, Jungian psychology and, and how it fits in with tarot. Um, the first thing, a couple of things that I wanted to, to say before I get going on it. Uh, the books behind me, I know that everyone looks at the books behind, just wanted to let you know if you want to have a closer look, I'll take a photograph of them. I have read about 20 to 30% of them. The rest of them um, are the ones that I have bought and I haven't got around to yet or I wish that I could read and haven't been able to for one reason or another. Um, so yes, the great, uh, the great mythical bookcase of all of the books that everyone thinks that everyone has read and my mythical bookcase is more of a case of the, um, the great Oz with the curtain pulled to one side. So I just thought that I would put that out there. One of the most important things that I wanted to start out with is that um, having gone and studied Jung for a while um, in a formal environment and also informally for the last few years, um, one of the main arguments that comes out, and I particularly saw this at university, um, was that nobody could really decide what Jung meant a lot of the time. And there was a lot of conjecture and a lot of argument and a lot of papers back and forth between Jung scholars about what, um, about what point Jung was making, where he was coming from, what he was trying to drive at. So that's a long way of saying that this is my interpretation of Jung and there will be people here who watch this who will, um, who if they have knowledge of Jung may agree with what I say or some of what I, what I say and may not agree with some of what I say and that's absolutely fine because this simply is my interpretation. I do not want this to come across as some kind of scholarly treatise on Jung where I am holding forth on on something where I am a, an expert because that's not it. I really have more than anything a working knowledge of it and that working knowledge is my own and it's what I have picked up through reading, through living, through working with clients, through working with tarot um, and, and I think it's really important to put that out there. Um, a case in point being Jordan Peterson who has his own approach to Jung and I know many Jung scholars are highly critical of the way that he understands Jung and how he teaches it but that is his particular approach and who am I to criticize him for that. One of the challenges with Jung is that he wrote very much in what is known as a circumambulatory way. Um, circumambulation is what he talked about in terms of how we approach the self or the soul or meaning or truth, the core of us. Um, and he did a lot of artwork around, um, around that kind of circumambulatory idea of uh, not being able to go directly to the point, but rather approaching it obliquely a lot of the time, simply because most of, well, nearly all of the time it is unobtainable. We cannot hold it directly. Um, we cannot encapsulate the meaning. We can, we can approximate it. And so a lot, of the, a lot of Jung's writing, and in fact, a lot of the way that I work as well, is um, a sort of repetitive rhythmical motion around a particular idea so that it's sort of worked over, worried over until something becomes clearer in the process of doing that. And that very much actually reflects, if anyone, if any one of you are in therapy, that's really the um, the way that therapy works as well. It's a going over and a re going over and a re going over again of territory, looking at it in new ways, um, assimilating things differently, um, with more things coming out in the in the relating and the experiencing of it. So. Jung started out in the medical field. He, he studied um, a medical degree and then at the Berkholtzi Institute, um, which, he invent, which he eventually headed, he was working a lot with people um, with profound mental health problems, most notably schizophrenia. And in fact, um, A Dangerous Method, how much of that, um, the movie A Dangerous Method was based on fact and how much is not, is up for conjecture. But, but that was about his time working with um, a particular patient there, um, Sabina Spielrein, who, who eventually did actually become a student and then an expert in, in um, analytical psychology and also psychoanalysis. But really, um, the, the, 
the crux of Jung's work is, is actually very similar to Freud's work. And Jung was, a, was really a disciple of Freud's until he broke away in um, 1912, when he, um, when he really deviated from Freud's view on sexuality. But the crux of both of those, um, both of those men's approaches were, was depth psychology. And by depth psychology, um, it, it sort of puts it um, in contrast with something like cognitive behavioral therapy um, and uh, things that work on the surface simply because depth psychology acknowledges the presence of the unconscious. And it was Freud that really brought this to the fore, the idea of the unconscious, the idea of the unconscious being um, not just operating in our psyches, but actually influencing us um, a whole lot more than our conscious minds did. So um, I often refer to the idea of, the, of a, an iceberg and the visible tip of the iceberg being the part of us that we are aware of, the bit that's just below the surface um, in our subconscious, our sort of, we, we have access to it if we are, in some way, we sort of stir up the waters or are able to look underneath. But then the vast majority of the psyche or our mind is, is re residing in the unconscious. And that is, is by far, you know, it is the underlying structure to everything that we are on the surface. And that depth psychology is really a method of working to access that rather than simply treating what's on the surface, which is simply the idea, you know, that treating the surface is like um, putting a plaster open over a gaping wound. It doesn't work. Um, analytical psychologist or Jungian analyst James Hollis talks about this, um, the idea of an analysis or working in, in the field of de depth psychology as working with, um, as working as if you're working on a building and the building's lighting and electrics are all wrong. And you can go and rewire a particular room in the building. You can go and do that. And, and if the underlying problem isn't there, then you know no amount of rewiring is going to do anything in the same way that cognitive behavioral therapy has been found in particular long-term studies, partic one that, um, that looked at CBT over 10 years that in anything that, that had a sort of depth element to the person's underlying problem. In other words, if, if the person was grappling with something that, and the genesis of that something was in childhood, in infancy, with family of birth, then any, any good that the CBT did was, was really rather rapidly undone um, over the ensuing months and years. And in fact, people were back to where they started after a year or two. So that analogy of the wiring is that you need to go into the basement, the basement of this building in order to rewire everything from the start. And the basement is that part of the iceberg that is under the surface. So it is working at depth. It is working with the unconscious. And, um, and so Jung and Freud in, those, in that respect were very much uh, alike in that. And in fact, Jung got a lot of his ideas from Freud with that. And, um, and, then, and then, as I said, broke away um, in a very, very painful break, I think, for both of them, um, just before the beginning of the First World War, where, where the fundamental disagreement, in a nutshell, was really that Jung didn't believe that um, sex and sexual drivers were really as important as Freud did. And that actually the drive was more towards what Jung called, you know, individuation. It's the drive to progress. It's the drive to become. Whereas, um, so the drive was, in other words, a drive towards something. It was a drive towards the future of potential. Whereas Freud's drive um, was very much based on the past and that we couldn't escape the past. And anything that we were doing now was simply to do with um, wounding, confrontation, damage um, that was done in, in our formative relationships and that, um, and that there wasn't so much a striving to the future, but actually having to look in and undo, um, undo all of these um, knots that had come up, particularly as a result of the um, unconscious, uh, sort of verboten, you know, um, just unallowed um, um, feelings of sex sexuality or attraction um, between um, 
you know, siblings to parents, so the Oedipus complex, so the, the, the son wanting to murder his father and marry his mother, and then the Electra complex, um, which is the, um, the daughter wanting to, to murder her mother and then marry her father. And, um, and Jung really didn't believe that that had quite as much of, um, of an impact on the psyche. As, as Freud did, and, and they did break away um, as a result of that. And I'm sure as a result of a lot of stuff in the unconscious that um, they were both grappling with as well. So, um, so that's depth psychology. It needs, um, it, it asks for any adherent, any person who's going into either therapy or analysis, and the difference between therapy and analysis is therapy once um, every week or two weeks, once or twice a week, analysis four or five times a week, um, every week. And it's, um, it's a different emphasis and there is a different process. Um, but they ask to go back. So it is, it is looking back, but it's not just looking back. It's not always sitting down and talking about, uh, in fact, um, Freudians much more about that, you know, that sort of old cliche, oh, tell me about your mother. Um, Jungian analysis is more about what is going on in terms of um, a person's dream life. Um, we'll get more, we'll get to that in a, um, a little bit later. But also in the dynamics between the um, analysand, the client, and the analyst themselves. So, um, so the dynamics between, um, between both of them are key to working out and working through the dynamics that one had um, with one's family of birth and particularly one's primary caregivers, whether they were present or absent or any permutation in between. Um, so, but, but Jungian psychology, unlike psychoanalysis, really has several very clear strands to it, which informs not only the way that people work in analysis and in Jungian therapy, but also in the way one approaches one's own life as well, and the way that um, I approach my tarot reading, for example. But here are several of the concepts um, in Jungian psychology that I, I feel are important. And I think probably um, other, you know, other students and experts of Jung feel the same way. And archetypes are very difficult to describe in and of themselves simply because in the describing of them, we come up against the problem of archetype itself. And that is that they are pure blueprints that are totally inaccessible directly through experience. They are blueprints of behaviors, of situations, scenarios. They are energy blueprints that we have um, that, that, we, that come through us, that work through us, work on us um, in, in ways that are both um, where we can see it happening, but we can't actually quite get back to the source, and in ways where we can't see it happening and it's working entirely in an unconscious level. And for the most part, uh, the archetypes reside in the unconscious. Their origin is in the deep unconscious. It's in what's known as the collective unconscious, which is something else that we'll get to later. But they really are, they are blueprints of situations um, and, and um, drives and um, anything actually that you get in the 78 tarot cards, each of those is an archetypal situation. The major arcana are, I would say, the sort of personality archetypes, the um, behavioral archetypes, the energies behind particular behaviors and thoughts and feelings. Whereas the minor arcana and the court, well, the court cards are personalities and also characters, people that you come across in everyday life, and also the, 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 um, the essence of who you are in any given moment. But then the minors are archetypal situations. Um, you know, whether the three of swords being the love triangle, or whether it's the two of cups being the falling in love, or whether it's the eight of discs or pentacles being, you know, the working, the working towards gaining expertise in something. They are all archetypal situations. The aces are the pure archetype of the suit. So in other words, they are utterly inaccessible, which is why I always take pains to say when an ace comes up that you really have to search for it. You have to actively engage in the searching of the ace in order to bring it down. Otherwise, it simply stays as pure potential because that's exactly what the aces are. They are non-incarnate. 
Um, so they are similar in other um, sort of in some ways to the majors in that um, they work through us in mysterious ways and um, and in order to in order to bring them into awareness we have to grapple with them a bit. So archetypes are they underlie um, they underlie Jungian thought and I'm just going to deviate very slightly into that because because the reason why um, religion and spirituality is so important to Jung is um, well there are several reasons for this the one is the environment in which Jung was raised born and raised um, you know he was his psychology is very much a product of of him as a person and, and his origins so Jung's father was um, a, a pastor in um, in Switzerland where he grew up. So his father was a pastor and by all accounts a very conservative pastor in the countryside and his mother was um, was a sort of a, was tended more towards spiritualism spiritualism and mediumship. So the two very contrasting aspects of spirituality sort of the one that was very much in in the um, this, the um, the everyday sort of prosaic way of going to church and then the other one which was very much part of his time. He grew up in a time when lots of people were holding seances. There was um, a great, very great stock held in psychic experiences, Ouija boards and things like that. Um, and in fact, one of Jung's first papers when he was young was was um, a paper to do with, I think it was his cousin and, and her um, mediumistic experiences and his way of explaining what he felt was happening in that. And it's one that was worth reading. Um, but so his background was very much um, a spiritual and religious one. And, and this, um, I think, very much informed his way of, of understanding the world and of archetypes. But what Jung came to as he got older and, and in his middle age and in his older life um, was the idea of revisiting religion and its symbols, not to become religious in the way that um, he was highly critical of, which is going to church and simply trotting out the same phrases over again. And the original religious or spiritual experience is lost in that, um, in that sort of rote chanting of something. There isn't, there isn't the originating sort of uh, numinous, as he would say, this sort of glow, this imbued with a meaning, spiritual meaning. The, there isn't that numinous um, experience when we um, simply read out of a prayer book. And in fact, his criticism of religion is that it was forever an attempt to revisit something that had long gone that it had lost its numinosity. However, he felt that the religious symbols, the old symbols, the symbols that could link us back, um, would link us back into archetypes. They would need to be revisioning, a re-energizing of them, a living out um, on a deeply personal, meaningful level of um, these religious symbols so that they, so that God came alive again, but on a, on an individual level, which is why Jung is always about the individual. He he believed that um, that that something was lost as soon as it was in a in a crowd, um, some, because it became about something else, or the crowd became more important. And actually, it's it's one's own search for meaning through this connection deep down and in, rather than out, rather than looking at a cross and trying to recreate something. It was about really experiencing the cross in the same way that we can experience the hanged man in tarot. So, so these religious symbols were, were part of the sort of archetypal um, experience that underpins what Jung feels is, is um, a true engagement with life. Um, so that's that's the archetypes in a nutshell. I I know that I've left loads out and I've probably got some of it wrong, but 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 really that's as best as I can um, approach it at the, um, for now. And one of the other things that is very um, that is prevalent in in Jungian um, psychology is the idea of complexes. Now complexes are linked to archetypes because they are. Complexes are, at their most simple, clusters 
of behaviors, um, feelings that act autonomously in an individual at an unconscious level until of course they become conscious and then, and then we can engage with them. Um, they, are, they are archetypes that also act autonomously through us. And in some way, when a complex is activated, we are possessed. Um, to use another sort of religiously imbued word. We are possessed by a complex. And we, um, it's difficult to, you can see it happening in other people. It's, it's quite difficult to, to um, identify it in ourselves. But one of the easiest ways of doing that is through our affect, our feelings, our emotions, um, and what our body is doing. So complexes, yes, are sort of sub-personalities that, that um, not only are active and active in the unconscious, but they very often run us. So they, um, we think we're in control, but, but very often the complexes are in control. And there are individual complexes and there are collective complexes. And um, I would say that, that understanding the nature of complexes, even on a rudimentary level, is so important right now because if you look at a newspaper, if you go onto a news website, if you go onto Twitter, if you go onto YouTube, you will see these complexes, particularly on a collective level, playing out all around us and running the show. They are running those individuals' lives and you will see, it's quite interesting, I've been watching with a lot of interest, that people in the grip, in an individual grip of a group complex will all act very similarly they are instructive. They are instructive about um, the damage that can be wrought, the level of unconsciousness that is often played out within these groups. And they are instructive because it can also assist us in knowing when we are susceptible to them. And in fact, I believe that there is no meaningful way to engage with a group without actually um, sparking our own complexes. Um, again, so that it's going back to that unapologetic, individualistic approach to things, which doesn't mean selfish and it doesn't mean a loner necessarily, though there are people who are individualists and loners. But really, um, it, individualism as in a sense of being responsible for one's own unconscious content and one's own life and one's own development and one's own search for meaning separately from everything and everyone else. Uh, because as soon as you engage with the kind of waves that are sweeping over the planet at the moment, um, there, is, there is very little way of, of working with them without being dunked or without joining the wave. So complexes, yes, autonomous aspects of the psyche residing in the unconscious that run us. We don't run complexes, they are more powerful than us. Um, so an example, another example of a complex um, would, be, um, would be obsessive compulsive disorder. That is a complex that's running us. Um, it, is, it is an autonomous, part of us that is, and if, and if you, if any of you have OCD, you will know how difficult it is to reason your way out of it and to break it because the amount of energy um, that it takes to engage with that complex enough to break it can itself bring a, a whole lot of unease and agitation um, with it. So, so there's, there's an idea of um, a complex is um, OCD. One of the other things that's, um, that, is, that is important in um, Jungian thought is the collective unconscious. And, um, and again, these things are all interwoven, so I will be going back over ground with this. So we have, um, let's look at the um, terms of the iceberg. We have the uh, conscious aspect of us above the surface, the subconscious, which is just beneath the surface, but accessible to conscious thought. If we have, you know, if we, if we try, it is, it is the first bit that's gonna come up. Then we have the unconscious, which is our own personal unconscious, which is the iceberg. And then we have the collective unconscious, which is really the depth of the ocean on which that iceberg is sitting. And, um, and it connects everything and everyone. And the collective unconscious is really also um, what would be the, um, 
our instinctive nature, our animal nature is, is part of the collective unconscious. It is that part of us that is connected again through um, to everything and everyone. So um, it is absolutely, it, it is inaccessible. It's inaccessible, it is the deepest layer of um, particularly what, what um, Jung would refer to as the psychoid. It is that ancient, arcane, sort of primordial part of us that is still active in us and through us and, and in everyone. And, um, and it, is, it, is, it is not able to be, and you can see I'm grappling with the words, and because every time you go and try and read about the collective unconscious and the psychoid, um, Jung is equally, well, I find it, it, I find it quite difficult to get to grips with Jung's writing when he starts writing about it, because he is trying to describe something that is, that is very much inaccessible. Um, but, but it, it, so, but where it links all of us together, that's also where collective complexes come from. So that is linked through the collective unconscious. So any anything that is shared. So for example, you get these stories, um, there's been quite a few where, where people spontaneously and for, so for no apparent reason will all start um, getting ill. Um, whether it's on an airplane, there's been quite a few of those and, and you know fumes have been ruled out and they've done tests and they can't find anything. Um, and, and things get, um, so people sort of succumb to these diseases or diseases. That is something running through, uh, quite um, arguably, um, the collective unconscious. It is, um, it is a primitive part of us and it is symbolic. So these, again, these ancient religious symbols, um, the myths, the um, the legends, all of these ones, that, the ones that go back to Sumerian roots, to ancient Egypt, um, Greece, they they describe collective experiences, but in an accessible way. So the idea of myth and mythical creatures are these aspects that reside in the collective unconscious, which is why very often people from you know across the world from each other in different um, different races, different religions different sex, you know, different, um, different ages will dream these same symbols because they are archetypal. They are archetypal dream images that come through and via the collective unconscious. Um, so, so that again, in a nutshell, is the collective unconscious. Um, and as I said, it's quite difficult to approach meaning or trying to understand it. That's as close as I got today. The last two things that I'm going to focus on in this area of um, Jungian psychology are two, um, two archetypes or two aspects of, that, that come up quite a lot in, in my tarot work and, um, and reside in our own personal unconscious, but also um, one of them resides as well in the, in the collective unconscious and one of them is connected to the collective. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it starts off personal, but then it, it, it has its roots deeper down in something else. So the first one is the idea of the shadow. Um, the shadow, in a nutshell, is anything that we say that we are not. That is it. That's anything that we say that we are not. In fact, um, and then I'll expand on that, it's anything that we know that we aren't. Because we are. And, and that's... Uh, and, and then... If any of you are sitting out there watching this and going, yeah, but you know, there will be exceptions to that because I, I really don't, I know that I'm not that. That's the shadow. It, it is absolutely those things that we can so easily disown because, because we know that they aren't us and yet they are. And um, there is that, that book um, on, um, from a Hindu, oh, who is it again? I'm going to have to look it up. I will. I'll leave this at the bottom of the of the video under the in the notes section, called "I Am That," and that's really what this is about: is the um, the idea that I am everything, and um, and there is a reason why these things reside in the shadow and are not in our in our conscious awareness, um, because we would be overwhelmed if we were to deal with all of this all at once. We simply cannot do that, and it's not healthy. Um, but I would say a healthy, a healthy attitude towards the shadow is, is having, an, um, having a curiosity. And that's a word that comes up in my work a lot, is that idea of a, of a curiosity about what it is that might be there um, out of our awareness 
that is, um, even though we can't see it, is there and it's also playing a role in our lives. So the shadow isn't just simply there sitting out of our awareness and doing nothing. It, um, very much like um, complexes to which it's related because it will be tied up in that, runs the show very often. So that, um, that lovely saying from the US where things come out sideways, we don't, we don't have that here in the UK, but um, I picked it up from a US friend and I absolutely love it. When things come out sideways, that's the shadow. It's that, um, it's that part of us that takes us totally by surprise um, and, it, and it's very often not very pleasant to see. Um, but, but if we don't make space for the possibility of the shadow, it does come out sideways. Or um, as Jung would say, to paraphrase him, it will come at us from the world and we will call it fate. So anything that we disown in ourselves will come at us from outside, in situations, in other people, and we will say, oh, it's just fate. Um, and, um, and yet it isn't. It was an aspect of us that in some way was pushed so far out, it had to come out another way. So shadow is what we disown. And shadow in the tarot, for example, um, well, I can think of a couple of cards. I mean, all cards have a shadow element um, to them because there will be aspects of the card, while not active, that will be out of our awareness and will still be there working in the background. But ones that sort of actively engage with the shadow, um, two major arcana cards that I can think of is the hermit who goes inside to deal with his shadow and then the devil which is the shadow in in pictorial form it's anything that we say that we aren't and there is um, a great amount of energy expended in keeping the shadow at bay um, and and so and so one of the one of the sort of one of the side effects of a lot of suppression, a lot of repression, denial, pushing things down, keeping things in the shadow, is um, fatigue. It's um, it's tiredness. It's lethargy, um, because a, a, a significant part of the psyche is expending a whole lot of energy trying to keep something out of conscious reach, um, and that's where shadow work comes into its own, because it really can, in a very measured way. Um, and when I say shadow work, I really, um, really the only shadow work that I'm particularly interested in now is, is of a therapeutic kind, um, whether that is psychotherapy or whether it's body therapy or something like that. But with somebody who is really fully qualified in, in the areas of, of psychodynamics and what's going on unconsciously. When shadow is worked like that, it can be an incredibly liberating experience, not just mentally, but also physically. There is a renewed vigor, there is more energy. But when something comes out sideways, it also comes out energetically. You know, it can come out really, really forcefully. And that, and that just goes to show how much has been residing in the shadow. And again, I will direct you to what's going on in the world. And I would say that a lot of the force and the, um, and I don't mean measured force, I mean the force that's being unleashed, let loose, that is, that is out of control, is shadow coming up to the surface. And with it, you know, it's being boosted up. It's like a volcano. It's just blasting up out into consciousness. And um, like a volcano, it, you know, no one is untouched in its vicinity. And this volcano appears to be worldwide at the moment. So, so that's the shadow. It is that part of us that we say that we're not. And then there is the final one that I'm going to deal with um, is the self. And the self is that personal aspect of us that is the whole us. It's us as a whole. So one of the, it, it is the true, it is the essence of you as an individual that is um, both unexpressed and expressed. It is the part of us that we seek in and when we go into analysis or when we go into therapy. Um, it is who we are when, when the guards are dropped, when um, the, the persona, you know, all of these masks that we put on are no longer there. Um, and, and sometimes those masks are, are absolutely, we need those masks. We, we often need those masks to survive. Um, sometimes we need those masks to get things done, to get through something, but very often we don't. Um, and it's really about seeing what's underneath the mask. 
and it might not be what you were expecting it to be. Um, in fact, there are some people whose lives are lived really very much from the level of the persona and um, they don't really get a glimpse of who they are underneath and because because there is a sense of some kind of um, some kind of devotion or loyalty to um, to the idea of what life should be whether that's because they were told that they shouldn't be something or they should be something or they needed to be a good little girl or they needed to man up and you know it's it's all of those different things that um, that make us live lives that aren't our own and the self is the truth of oneself it is when those masks are unmasked and and for me, the circumambulatory work um, in Jungian work is to approach the self, which is at the center of, um, of all of these layers. And, um, and again, we never can truly know the self, but more of the self can come through um, once we work with um, our complexes, once we work with our shadow, once we, you know, sift through the pain, go through the pain, release the pain, you know, release all of these pent up emotions, anything that is sort of running the show again, complexes. Um, and, and the self, is not necessarily pleasant. Um, I'll say, I, I, I wrote um, an article and I'll link to it underneath. I think a lot of you've probably read it. Um, it's called um, The Dark Side of the Shadow Seekers. And, um, and really what I say there is that, that when you start excavating the self and you get closer to who you really are, who you really are, not what somebody else wants you to be or what you thought you should be or what you believed that you were, um, you might not necessarily be the kind of bright, sparkly, popular person that you aspired to be um, when you were younger, but, but you are more you and there is a lot more peace that comes with that. Um, I am definitely of the same mind as James Hollis where striving for happiness, I think, is, um, is a pursuit that is doomed to fail and in fact the older I get the the less I want to strive for happiness. I would rather strive for wholeness and in, in Jung's words I would rather be whole than good. Um, there is um, in wholeness um, there is a, a veracity, a certain truth to one oneself that, that brings peace, but it doesn't necessarily bring popularity and in fact if you're seeking that out then that that is no doubt um, part of that facade, that false self that is there that, um, that we put in place at some stage to protect us from something, whether that was the anger of our parents or the judgment of our peers. Um, so the self is really the, the goal in individuation, is to, um, is to live out the self as fully as possible. Um, and some people may agree with me and on that and some people may disagree but I definitely think that that for me is the essence of what it is to live a Jungian life. Um, and, and really that's, that's the final idea, I think I'm just going to wrap this up in terms of the self because the idea for me is, is that idea of individuation. Now. I think that Jungian analysis is really one of the only approaches that, that, that works specifically with midlife. Um, and the reason why it works with midlife is because when we are younger, we need, we need to build up ego strength. We need to go out into the world. We're like those knights in the tarot deck. We go out seeking our fortune. We want recognition. We want money. We want to have peer recognition. We want promotion. You know, whether we get it or not is a different thing. But we want to, we want to make an, our name in the world in one way or another. And, um, you know, and either we are supported in that or thwarted uh, in that, either by internal or external circumstances. But broadly speaking, there is a drive out into the world to do things. And then round about midlife, and as, as James Hollis says, this is not an age, but it's rather a stage. Um, but it will happen sort of, you know, roughly between the ages of like 30, 35 to 55 we realize that all of those things don't bring us what we want anymore. And in fact, we don't particularly like where we are and we might not even like who we are. And, uh, and so we go back 
inside to search for meaning. And that meaning is that passage in midlife that is that passage towards individuation. So instead of going out into the world and making a name for ourselves, we start to ask ourselves what our real name is, um, who we are, and we separate out from everyone else. That doesn't mean that we have to be alone. It doesn't mean we have to be lonely. But what we're doing is that we are separating from identifying with any anything else that is external to us. That our truth is um, derived from inside rather than trying to find the truth outside in, in a particular thing. And, um, and so that individuation is is key to the work of Jung and in when you go into therapy to, to become oneself, to individuate, to break away. Um, and the paradox being there that, um, that you're breaking away and yet acknowledging that you are deeply connected to everything and everyone as well. So um, breaking away and then, and then also trying to deny roots um, and not just our roots in our families but our roots our rootedness within aware within consciousness within the unconscious within the symbolic world to to try and break away and not have that is to be anchorless to be rudderless and and really to um to lose one's sense of oneself even while one's trying to find one's sense of oneself so so individuation is that important work of both becoming oneself and realizing that you're part of everything. And one of the one of the markers of individuation, one of the what and and again this comes up a lot in in the readings. Um, but one of the one of the places where you really see the individuation or the act or the process of individuation is is active in one's life is working with paradox. Younger people don't like paradox, generally. They don't like it. They want to solve it. They want, um, they want to be able to release that, um, that sense of pent-up energy um, by coming down on one side or the other. Um, that, um, and it's not actually just younger people, but, but really, you know, that search and going out into the world and finding meaning, you will generally find that paradox does not sit well. Um, as you get older and you realize that paradox is an inherent part of life, um, then you start to see paradox in a different way. And in fact, paradox then starts to be the defining part of one's work. Um, so for example, a paradox that I face in my own work is that I, I understand and want to strive to be something different um, in terms of therapy. But I also know that there are parts of me that will always be very much the same and I cannot change them. So I want to strive towards something new and I know that I can't break away from what I am, am at heart in terms of some patterns. Um, and, and then I want to resolve it one way or the other. So you can either sort of rest back into this sort of um, despair of never being able to um, never being able to get it right, you know, which is trying to resolve the paradox. Despair is a kind of form of resolving it because you resolve to, you know, that you're that you just you're just a fuck up. Um, or you want to resolve it by saying, um, I am ascending. I can feel my consciousness raising. I am, you know, I, I really believe that I'm living my new life. I've got rid of my story. I'm, um, I'm becoming a new person. And that again is, is, is not, is no, it's not accepting that there are intrinsically parts of oneself that just will be the way that they are. And the paradox then is to sit there and resolve neither of them. You know, I am a product of my past. I am striving towards my future. I want to be something new. I know I can't be something new. And, um, and then to resist the resolution of the paradox creates what's known in, in Jungian terms as the transcendent function, or it's the, it's, the, it's the third way. It's the thing that happens that you can't make happen. You can't make the third way happen by going, all right, I'm now going to create a third way out of this. It is by sitting still when things feel incredibly uncomfortable because you want to come down on one side or the other and you want answers and you want things to be solved and tied up and you want loose ends, you know, just put away um, and, and you, um, you want answers. And, and then you sit in that moment and you, and you stop looking for answers. 
And then there's that paradox that when you stop looking, you probably have the greatest chance of actually finding something valuable rather than finding fool's gold. Um, so, so working with paradox is, is really, I would say, one of the most important parts of the individuation process. And, and certainly for me, um, in terms of my work with others and my work in my own therapy, it has become a key component of, of my own, um, of, of how I experience life and how I experience others and how I experience myself. So, so that is um, really what I want to cover today. I think that what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a separate video about the way that tarot fits into this. Otherwise, it's going to be too long. So um, when that happens, I will let you know. But for now, I am going to leave it at that. And um, if you have questions, if I didn't, if I wasn't clear anywhere and, and um, I'm almost certain that there are going to be things that need explaining, um, then, then please do ask questions. You can leave a comment below the video or you can email me sarah at integratedtarot.com. But otherwise, I wish you well in your own searches, wherever they take you and whoever it is that you are becoming.